Hi, welcome to Lesson 5, Unit 6, Empire of Liberty, uh, the Presidency and the Era of Thomas Jefferson. So today we're actually not going to start things off with the whole question. We're going to look at this painting instead. This painting uh, was painted in 1840 by a famous British painter, uh, J.M.W. Turner. If you take a close look at this painting, a lot of details stand out. Um, it's clear that there's a ship in the background that's tossing in the waves. The sea is very, very, very vi uh, violent, and there seems to be some kind of a storm brewing in the background. Also in the background, we see a sun kind of setting or maybe rising. It's kind of unclear. Turner was a master using uh, light, and so it, it, it seems like you can see the light dancing off the waves as they crash in the sea. If we look closer to the foreground, though, of the picture, what we see is a little bit more disturbing. Um, very, very closely in, you can see that there are hands sticking out of the water. In fact, in the lower left hand, right hand corner, I apologize, there's a leg sticking out of the water and there are many, many fish that seem to be gobbling and consuming the human beings that are underwater. All of a sudden, this painting seems a lot more disturbing than it originally did. And if you look really closely at those hands and the leg, the limbs that are sticking out of the water, you'll see black bands. These are chains. Something's not right with this picture. So Turner, in addition to painting this picture several years earlier, actually wrote a poem about the same theme. The poem was never published and it was never finished, but let's take a look at that poem and see if it provides us with any additional hints about what this painting is all about. Aloft all hands, strike the top masts and belay. Yon angry setting sun and fierce edged clouds declare the typhoon's coming. Before it sweeps your decks, throw overboard the dead and dying. Ne'er heed their chains. Hope, hope, fallacious hope. Where is thy market now? So it seems like there's a typhoon coming and... The crew is throwing overboard their dead and dying, and there's no hope, and there's chains. And there's also this mention of a market. Well, this is a slave market, and this picture is called the slave ship. And it actually deals with an instance of probably the most disgusting act of insurance fraud imaginable. Insurance fraud, if you're not really aware, is where a business or an investor um, purchases insurance in order to prevent um, disaster if the in, in case of something terrible happening. So a business owner, for example, might buy insurance, flood insurance, to, to um, provide them with a certain degree of protection in case of a flood. Or a business owner might buy fire insurance. And in case their business were to go up in flames, the owner of that insurance policy could go up to the insurance company and collect some money to help them, I guess, uh, deal with the costs of losing their business to fire. Insurance, insurance fraud, however, is when a businessman deliberately destroys their business or their property in order to illegally collect on an insurance claim. This painting specifically was inspired by the insurance fraud case of the slave ship Zong. The captain of the slave ship realized that his um, cargo of human beings, slaves from Africa, uh, they were... Uh, they were very, very sick and were not going to make a whole lot of money on the open market. And so what the captain decided to do was throw these people overboard, kill them, and lie and say that a typhoon came and swept them off the ship. This way the captain could collect on insurance, actually get money, guaranteed money. Um, at the, and at the same time, uh, he, he killed 110 innocent African Amer Africans on board the ship. It's an absolutely dreadful situation. And it's one of the, um, it's a classic example of the horrors that took place uh, during the transatlantic slave trade, where millions of Africans were transported across the Atlantic Ocean to serve as slaves in Central, North, and South America. This is one of the grimmest topics that I'm ever going to teach. Um, and today what we're going to do is we're going to focus in on essential question number five. How do captains maintain control of their human cargo aboard slave ships? Um, by control, I mean how did captains and crew take away the freedoms of the Africans on board the slave ships so that they could guarantee their survival and guarantee that they did not up and rebel against the captain 
rebellions, uprisings happened all the time on these slave ships, as you can imagine. Um, and the captains of these slave ships came up with very, very unique and effective ways to make sure that this didn't happen. Before we begin, let's watch this TED Ed video on the transatlantic slave trade. It's a fantastic video that does a really, really good job um, describing the context of why the slave trade took place um, and who benefited, and also the in enormous costs of this incredibly horrible, horrible uh, human tragedy. Slavery, the treatment of human beings as property, deprived of personal rights, has occurred in many forms throughout the world. But one institution stands out for both its global scale and its lasting legacy. The Atlantic slave trade, occurring from the late 15th to the mid-19th century and spanning three continents, forcibly brought more than 10 million Africans to the Americas. The impact it would leave affected not only these slaves and their descendants, but the economies and histories of large parts of the world. There had been centuries of contact between Europe and Africa via the Mediterranean, but the Atlantic slave trade began in the late 1400s with Portuguese colonies in West Africa and Spanish settlement of the Americas shortly after. The crops grown in the new colonies, sugarcane, tobacco, and cotton, were labor-intensive, and there were not enough settlers or indentured servants to cultivate all the new land. American natives were enslaved, but many died from new diseases, while others effectively resisted. And so, to meet the massive demand for labor, the Europeans looked to Africa. African slavery had existed for centuries in various forms. Some slaves were indentured servants, with a limited term and the chance to buy one's freedom. Others were more like European serfs. In some societies, slaves could be part of a master's family, own land, and even rise to positions of power. But when white captains came offering manufactured goods, weapons, and rum for slaves, African kings and merchants had little reason to hesitate. They viewed the people they sold not as fellow Africans, but criminals, debtors, or prisoners of war from rival tribes. By selling them, kings enriched their own realms and strengthened them against neighboring enemies. African kingdoms prospered from the slave trade, but meeting the Europeans' massive demand created intense competition. Slavery replaced other criminal sentences, and capturing slaves became a motivation for war, rather than its result. To defend themselves from slave raids, neighboring kingdoms needed European firearms, which they also bought with slaves. The slave trade had become an arms race, altering societies and economies across the continent. As for the slaves themselves, they faced unimaginable brutality. After being marched to slave forts on the coast, shaved to prevent lice, and branded, they were loaded onto ships bound for the Americas. About 20% of them would never see land again. Most captains of the day were tight packers, cramming as many men as possible below deck. While the lack of sanitation caused many to die of disease, and others were thrown overboard for being sick, or as discipline. The captains ensured their profits by cutting off slaves' ears as proof of purchase. Some captives took matters into their own hands. Many inland Africans had never seen whites before and thought them to be cannibals, constantly taking people away and returning for more. Afraid of being eaten or just to avoid further suffering, they committed suicide or starved themselves, believing that in death, their souls would return home. Those who survived were completely dehumanized, treated as mere cargo. Women and children were kept above deck and abused by the crew, while the men were made to perform dances in order to keep them exercised and curb rebellion. What happened to those Africans who reached the New World, and how the legacy of slavery still affects their descendants today, is fairly well known. But what is not often discussed is the effect that the Atlantic slave trade 
had on Africa's future. Not only did the continent lose tens of millions of its able-bodied population, but because most of the slaves taken were men, the long-term demographic effect was even greater. When the slave trade was finally outlawed in the Americas and Europe, the African kingdoms whose economies it had come to dominate collapsed, leaving them open to conquest and colonization. And the increased competition and influx of European weapons fueled warfare and instability that continues to this day. The Atlantic slave trade also contributed to the development of racist ideology. Most African slavery had no deeper reason than legal punishment or intertribal warfare, but the Europeans who preached a universal religion and who had long ago outlawed enslaving fellow Christians needed justification for a practice so obviously at odds with their ideals of equality. So they claimed that Africans were biologically inferior and destined to be slaves, making great efforts to justify this theory. Thus, slavery in Europe and the Americas acquired a racial basis, making it impossible for slaves and their future descendants to attain equal status in society. In all of these ways, the Atlantic slave trade was an injustice on a massive scale, whose impact has continued long after its abolition. A horrible and terrible legacy indeed. I had the opportunity to actually travel to Ghana on the Gold Coast in Western Africa about seven years ago. And when I was there, I arrived at a place called El Mina. This is a picture of El Mina along the coast. As you can see, this is clearly a fort, uh, some kind of castle. It was built by the Portuguese in the 14th century. El Mina is chock full of arms and armaments. There's mortars, there's cannonballs really does have the look of a classic fortification on a, on a uh, coast. And at first, when the fort was built, it was built to protect the um, Portuguese gold trade. Basically, they were taking a lot of gold from uh, Western Africa and transporting it back to Europe. And they wanted to make sure that there weren't going to be any pesky pirates that were going to take their gold. So the fort was heavily armed and it would fire upon pirates, etc., etc., with big guns. At around, um, <clears throat> I believe, 1657, however, the fort was uh, seized by the Dutch, folks from the Netherlands, and they converted it to a very different use. The picture right here shows a blue door. The blue door is the door into the fortress chapel. Right out front of the door, there is a hole, and the hole right now is boarded up, as you can see. The idea for this hole is this. When Europeans, when the Dutch were done with their church service, they would leave church and they would have bread in their hands. They would feel really good about themselves and really good about everything. And so they would basically drop some of the bread into the hole in front of them. The hole would be, the hole led straight to a slave dungeon. That slit right there is the only light that would enter the slave dungeon, believe it or not. And in that slave dungeon, there would be upwards of 200 men. The, um, dungeon, if you can imagine the size of my classroom, was roughly the same dimensions. Imagine 200 people crammed inside my classroom. That's how tight it was. There was no room for people to sit down. There was no room for people to lie down. Um, it was a, a truly, truly miserable experience. While I was in the um, slave dungeon, the tour guide suddenly broke into a song. And that song was Amazing Grace. I know you've heard this song before, but let's listen to the first two stanzas as sung by the great and inimitable Elvis Presley. Never mind, that's taking forever to load. The point is this. I was really surprised when they sang the Amazing Grace hymn, and I didn't know why they did it. It wasn't until later that I realized that the guy who wrote the song Amazing Grace, John Nelson, was actually a slave captain. And he, he actually captained one of the slave ships that crossed the Atlantic for years. Eventually, he became very religious and decided that uh, being part of the slave trade was completely wrong. And he became a very famous abolitionist. But just imagine that the song that so many Americans grow up singing was actually written by somebody who was involved in the slave trade. <laughs> 
this map right here shows the Middle Passage. The slave trade consisted of three major uh, journeys. Slaves would be brought from the Gold Coast or from Africa and, and transported either to South America, Central America, the Caribbean, Jamaica, Cuba, and Hispaniola, or North America. Uh, there they would be used as slaves to grow things like cotton, um, uh, tobacco, and other crops, and sugar as well. These crops would be transported to Europe where they would be um, eaten or enjoyed. In the case of sugar, it would be converted to molasses and molasses to rum. And then Europe would trade manufactured goods to African leaders in order to get their hands on more slaves. This is how the transatlantic slave trade basically operated for upwards of 200 years, longer than 200 years actually by far. All in all, about 12.5 million slaves were transported to the Americas. 12% did not survive the journey. Finally, in America in 1808, uh, the slave trade was banned. It, this ban actually benefited Southern slave owners because since there were so few slaves coming in, the value of the um, slave owners, slaves in the South, increased. If there's less supply and a lot of demand, the value of what you have increases. Anyway, um, one of the things that ultimately led to the slave trade being banned was the publication of images like this. This is a description of a slave ship, specifically the slave ship Brooks. And if you look at this diagram, you can see how African Africans were transported across the Atlantic Ocean. They were laid flat in shelves and squished side by side, chained down with absolutely no room to move. And they would be in this position for days on end. Talk about agony. This image, probably more than any other image, was responsible for convincing people in Britain, specifically, that the slave trade was evil. British subjects could look at this diagram very closely and see the faces of other human beings, and it, was, it had a very, very powerful effect. As you can see, uh, slaves were bound, and they were, their movement was very heavily limited by um, things like fetters and manacles. Our essential question for today, just to remind you, is to come up with all of the reasons, um, all of the ways, I'm sorry, that slave crews and captains maintain control of their live cargo. Um, manacles, the control of movement, was one of the most, uh, was one of the most important ways that control was maintained. However, um, there was one choice that all the people, there, there was one choice that slaves had and it was mentioned in the movie, and that choice was they could just choose not to eat. They could choose to commit suicide, and many of them actually did so. Slave ship captains and crew members <coughs> eliminated this choice using this tool, the speculum yeah, oris. Office, uh, yeah, this thing is here. used to force open individuals' mouths so that people could be force-fed. Um, anyway reason that we know anything about the slave trade and we know about these terrible things that took place on slave ships is because of the writings of Alauda Equiano. Alauda Equiano at the age of 11 was sold into slavery and actually experienced firsthand what life was like on a slave ship. His account published in the late 18th century was literally one of the only accounts that we have related to um, what went on in slave ships and for that reason it is incredibly precious. I've attached a copy of this account um, uh, in, this, in today's lesson, and I would like you to read it uh, because this will help you um, complete your own slave ship narrative, uh, where I would like you to write from the perspective of somebody on board a slave ship and describe what the experience was like. Thank you very much, and have a good day.